So today's topic is understanding lenses. This is another in the series of my Monday and Thursday presentations. I've uh, got tutorials, Q&A sessions, and conversations with photographers and other people in the photo industry. Um, coming up this week on Thursdays, my guest is going to be Matthew Jordan Smith, and that's going to be in the evening at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 Eastern, uh, because Matthew's joining us from Tokyo, where it will be Friday morning for him but it's Thursday evening for us. So remember, join on Thursday evening and there's a different URL for that one. It's cornicello.com slash MJS instead of QA. Then next week, I've got Bambi Cantrell coming in, another great photographer. Uh, it'll be fun to talk with her and then we'll see where we go from there. But here, uh, we're gonna cover most if not all of these topics today. I'll question some facts about lenses that everyone knows or thinks that they know. We'll consider how using short wide angle lenses make things all distorted and drawn out or how a long lens compresses the scene, or do they? But first, an executive summary. Uh, so I'm gonna repeat a lot of this at the end. Uh, just, you know, you have to decide where you wanna be for the photo. Don't let the lens make the decisions for you. The lens doesn't have a brain. It can't change its optical properties as you move closer or further from a subject. It doesn't have legs to get up and moving closer or move back. You are the brains and ultimately responsible for making the photograph. You're responsible for everything that shows up in the frame. Uh, the basic takeaway is the closer you are to your subject, the smaller the background's gonna be, and the further away you are from your subject, the more compressed things are gonna look. I think there's a difference between going out with a camera and looking for things to photograph, and then, then with going out with a photograph in mind and going out with intention. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. But first I wanna say, don't blame the lens when you see all this distortion and stuff. Uh, as we said, you're responsible for the contents and you cannot zoom with your feet. I'm not telling you to stay in one spot, quite the opposite. I want you to move around, crouch down, climb up a ladder, find different vantage points to alter your perspective. But know that once you move your feet, you're no longer zooming. So let's start with the basics. We'll start with focal length. Focal length is fixed in manufacturing. You can't change it. It determines the magnification of the lens and combined with the film or sensor size determines the field of view. What it does not do is alter perspective. So here's what you might see on, written on some lenses that describe them. Here we have a 35 millimeter prime lens. That's an F2. Then we have a 70 to 200 zoom lens. It's 2.8 constant across the zoom. Then there's a 25, 28 to 105 focal length lens zoom that changes its aperture. So it's not a constant aperture, it's a variable aperture. Wide open, it's a little faster than when it's zoomed in. And I'll cover those things in more detail as we go along. What I really wanna concentrate on is this bullet point. Combined with the film sensor size determines the field of view. Both of these photos were made with a four millimeter lens. Those of us in the world of 35 millimeter cameras, which includes all the full frame DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, that sounds extremely wide. And if this four millimeter was used on a 35 millimeter camera, it would be very short and wide. But these photos were taken with an iPhone. An iPhone four millimeter is just a bit wider than a normal lens because of the small sensor size on the phone. So take a look at these two photos. They're both made at 24 inches from the subject but very different focal lengths, four millimeters and 24 millimeters. Of course, one is the iPhone and one is with a full frame mirrorless camera. They look similar because the sensor sizes are very different too. Like I said before, if I had a four millimeter on the big camera, you'd see a much wider view, probably including my feet in the image. So what is the focal length of the lens? It's a measure of the, of the length of the lens when it's focused at infinity from the center, optical center to the film plane. As you focus the lens closer, the lens gets longer and extends its, its um, focal length. Eventually this has an effect on the exposure. If you focus closer than about 10 times the focal length, you need to compensate for your exposure for the loss of light. You know non-macro lenses can only focus to a minimum distance away. And, um, the issue I think was with camera meters or with external meters, because up until about 10 times, the lens isn't losing too much light. 
Um, but after you come into 10 times, you'll, you have a light loss that isn't compensated for by an external meter. Let's look at a couple of lens specs and look, see how this works out. So we have the 50 millimeter times 10 is 500 millimeters. It's about 1.6 feet. And if you look at the closest focusing distance that for that lens, it's 1.5 feet. On the 400 Canon times 10 is 13 feet and therefore closest focus is 11 and a half feet. So it's, it's relatively close right in there. Uh, so some people get confused about focal length on smaller sensor cameras like APS-C and Micro Four Thirds. The cameras do not increase the focal length of the lens. The smaller sensor just sees less of the image projected by the lens. It has a narrower field of view, so you see less of the surrounding edges. So in this image here, you have what your eye sees as the outside gray, then the circle projected by the lens, then what's captured in blue by a full frame camera, and, and in red by a smaller sensor camera. So just want to say it did not make the lens any longer. It just shows you less of the scene. Field of view is what fits into the frame at a certain magnification and certain center size. Larger lenses have more magnification and a narrower field of view. So here, say you take the center green, which blue section is probably like a 200 millimeter lens. You got the purples of 150, the orange is a 135, and you work your way out to maybe a 24 at the extremes. So all the lens is doing is making the scene narrower or wider according to the focal length. Aperture or f-stop. Uh, think of the aperture or f-stop like a water faucet. Adjusting it controls how much light flows through the lens. It also controls the depth of field in the photo. We express the, the um, aperture as an f number. Wider apertures, smaller f numbers are referred to as fast. Uh, just a quick note on depth of field for those not familiar with it. The lens can only focus on one plane. So here I'm showing that with the black line. So at f4, the depth of field shown in pink is pretty shallow, but as you stop down the lens to f11, it gets deeper, extending both in front of and behind the focus plane. There's a lot more of depth of field coming up, but just remember it's the area of the photo that's in focus from front to back, or from front to back that's acceptably in focus. So back to aperture. We use the term f-stop to talk about the different sizes. In the old days, you can open the back of your camera and look through it to see what is happening inside when you stop down the lens. You can't do that with a digital, so some people might not even realize what's happening when they stop down their lens. So here's a series of photos of the diaphragm of a lens set to various f-stops. I'm saying a simple lens here because most camera lenses are very complex with multiple groups of elements, especially zoom lenses that don't extend as they're zoomed. This will come up later when I mention constant aperture zoom lenses. But the f-stop is the size relationship between the aperture and the focal length. So if you have a 100 millimeter lens with a 25 millimeter aperture, 100 divided by 25 is an f4 lens. And if it was 50 millimeters, 100 divided by 50 is two, so it'd be an f2 lens. The smaller numbers, F4, 2.8, 2.0, 1.4, are the larger openings because they're actually fractions. They allow more light to reach the sensor. Larger numbers, 8, 11, and 16, are smaller apertures allowing less light. If you can't remember which way to go, think of pizza. F2 is larger opening than F8. When you cut the pizza into two slices, you get much bigger slices than when you cut into eight. So two or one half is a larger lens opening than F8 or one over eight. So the key to f-stops is the square root of two or 1.4. Each stop in the progression is 1.4 times the previous rounded off sum. So we have f-stops, the standard progression is one, 1 1.4, 2.0, 2.8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, and on. But your camera meter might use half or third stop increments like 6.3, 7.195, et cetera. They just fall in between the main numbers. So here are all three ranges. The top line lists the full stops, then we have the half stops, and then, then the third stops that go between the full stops. The, the lines are drawn there, place the full stops into the progressions.
So the more you stop down the lens, the more depth of field you get, but at the same time, the more diffraction you get. That is, as the aperture gets smaller, the light rays have to bend around it. Sort of think of like putting your thumb over the end of a garden hose and it starts spraying around. It's not exactly the same, but you get the idea that the um, light be beams coming out around the lens interfere with each other and cause a softer image. So you have to decide if depth of field is more important or sharpness is more important to your image when you get down to like F11, 13, 16, or 22. Let's talk about prime lenses. Prime lenses are fixed single focal length lens like a 24 millimeter or a 50 millimeter or 200 millimeter. Uh, they're usually faster and then zoom lenses and they're usually a bit sharper than zoom lenses but a lot of today's zoom lenses are really done very well. So back to this image again. The 35 is a prime lens. It only has one focal length. The other two are zoom lenses, 70 to 200 and 28 to 105. So a zoom lens provides a range of focal lengths. So we have a 24 to 70, a 24 to 105, 70 to 200, 100 to 400. Um, they're generally as slower than the prime lenses of the same focal length range. They should maintain their focus when they're zoomed in or out. If they don't maintain focus, then it should be called a very focal lens. So zooming maintains the perspective. Perspective is the size relationship between elements in the scene, how they re relate to each other. You can't zoom with your feet because that is a dolly move. Zooming in from the same camera position is akin to cropping in post. So a dolly move is more natural and what usually used in movies and videos. Uh, most cinematographers I've talked to don't like zoom lenses. The look you get from zooming is not really natural. There are exceptions though. And there's a great scene in the movie Goodfellas that you can look up on YouTube that uses a combination of a dolly zoom move. The they film two characters sitting across a table from each other in a diner. And as the camera pulls back, the lens is zoomed in. The characters remain the same size in the frame, but the background gets larger and larger. You'd also see this in movies like Vertigo. Alfred Hitchcock used it a lot. When changing the focal length of the lens from a fixed camera position, the magnification of the objects in the scene changes, but the relationship between the objects stays the same. Note the relationship between the word perspective and the subject's neck and between the subject and the other subjects behind. When zooming in and out, they do not move in relationship to each other. When the camera position is moved, the perspective, the relationship between the elements in the scene changes. When moving in closer, the object closest to the camera increases in size rapidly, while the background elements remain virtually the same size. So we have fixed aperture zoom lenses. They're called constant aperture. And that's like the 70 to 200 28 or 70 to 200 F4. Uh, they're generally larger, heavier, and more expensive than variable aperture zoom lenses. And it should go without saying, but I have had people ask me um, that all the f-stops, other f-stops are there too. Variable aperture ranges. The zoom lens where the maximum aperture changes as the lens is zoomed. So an example is 70 to 300, 35 to 56. The lens is slower with a smaller maximum aperture as the focal length increases. It's less expensive and less weight than a fixed aperture zoom. So again, back to this image. The 70 to 200 is the fixed aperture. The 28 to 105 is the variable aperture. Other terms is on the lens, say the one in the middle is an L lens, which is Canon's top of the line and it has image stabilization, that's what the IS it means, and ultrasonic focusing motor, the USM. So lens speed, uh, as we said, lenses with wide apertures are fast lenses. They'll be marked with the maximum aperture on the lens as we've shown. 
and the max aperture might not match the standard f-stop, but will fall into the progression. That zoom lens we looked at there in the last slide at 3.5, then goes to 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, and on. The magnification is determined by the focal length of the lens, and it's linear. You double the focal length, and you get an image that's twice the magnification. As we showed before, it combines with the sensor size and shape to determine the field of view or what fits into the scene as seen by the camera. We have teleconverters. There's one here. So these go between the lens and the camera, and they magnify the image from the lens. Uh, they're usually 1.4 or 2x converters. This happens to be a 2x. Uh, they maintain the same closest focusing distance of the lens, but they allow less light to pass through. So a 1.4 converter will lose a stop of light. A 2x loses two stops of light. Image stabilization. Uh, there's various ways of stabilizing the image. It, it's, it counteracts the sh camera shake that you typically have when using longer lenses at long shutter speeds. It can either shake the elements to match the movement of the camera, or it can move the sensor. Uh, the sensor is called in-body stabilization. Uh, in-body works for well for uh, shorter lenses. On longer lenses, it's better to have the IS in the lens. Doesn't do anything to help with the subject movement or blur, uh, motion blur. And we have macro lenses. Uh, macro officially means a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio. Uh, that means the subject is the same size on the camera sensor as it is in real life. The macro lens is focused closer by moving the lens elements further away from the sensor plane. Like we showed before, this gives a loss of light. Uh, TTL metering accounts for it, but if you're using handheld meter or using your flash meter, you'll need to figure out compensation. There is a formula for that. The bellows draw minus focal length over half of the focal length. You're probably never going to use this, but I was just so proud that I remembered this formula that I used to use all the time with large format cameras back in the 80s. So here's a couple of macro examples. Here, the matchstick is the same size in the camera sensor as it is in real life. Next to it is a creature I found in a lemon one day. So close focusing versus macro. You can find many zoom lenses that call themselves macro, but they're really close focusing because they do not get down to the one-to-one -one macro range. As I said, it's usually on zoom lenses and it's often misnamed as macro. Uh, another way to get closer is extension tubes. And here's a couple of them. Extension tubes, again, go between the camera and the lens, but they're empty tubes. There's no no glass in them, they just extend the lens out. Um, be careful if you're buying them because sometimes the really cheap ones don't have any electrical contacts, so you can't control the aperture and other things in your lenses. But try to find ones that have the, the contacts in there. Uh, when you use them, you lose infinity focus. Uh, they can only focus in closer on things. A less expensive way, not always as great quality, are close-up lenses. They look like filters and attach at the front of the lens, and they alter the focal length of the lens. Again, these allow you to focus closer than normal. Uh, they can degrade the image, especially at the edges, but they're better quality ones. So let's see if I have a couple here. So there's, this is a plus four. And this one is, that's a plus one. So you can stack them if you want to, to get even closer. Um, here's the higher quality one. This is a Canon vert one that has two glass elements in it and it's much better correction. So as I say, you can combine them. So if you had a one and a four, you get a five plus five. Um, when you do combine them, put the stronger one closer to the camera. And don't stack more than two. So basically what they're doing is changing infinity focus, bringing it in closer. So let's put some of the lenses to work. First thing we're going to talk about is focusing, and we'll start with having your viewfinder be in focus. There should be a little dial slider or lever next to your eyepiece that adjusts the diopter as you're looking through the eyepiece. So you want to put the lens completely out of focus in manual focus mode, point at a plain white wall, and adjust the, dop the diopter until the items in the viewfinder are sharp and clear. 
You want the information to be in focus. Don't worry about what the lens is seeing. Some notes about manual focusing. Standard focusing screens simulate a depth of field between f2.8 and f4. So if you're using a wider lens like an f1.4 or 1.2, you're not going to get the true depth of field looking through the viewfinder. It's better to use live view or a mirrorless camera if you want to focus in accuracy with very fast lenses. Back in the old days, and maybe on the top end cameras today, you can change the focusing screen. So you can pull out the regular screen and put in one that's designed to work with the faster lenses, but those black out or get really dark with slower lenses. So there's always a trade-off. You always have to be opening the camera and taking the focusing screen in and out. But with mirrorless, we're starting to get away from that because mirrorless shows you exactly what the lens is seeing. Uh, let's talk about depth of field. The range from foreground to background in an image that's acceptably sharp. It's not an exact science. It depends on a larger variety of factors, including print size, viewing distance. And there's no hard line where things fall into and out of focus. Um, so I'm gonna just try to be, give you practical info here. There's a great site if you want more in-depth coverage called cambridgeincolor.com. Uh, pull, pull down that URL and go visit them. He's got really great stuff there. So talking about depth of field, as I mentioned earlier, lenses can only focus on one plane at one distance at a time. Everything in front of behind the plane is out of focus. And those out of focus areas appear as blur circles or polygons. And my definition of a blur circle is a group of photographers sitting around a table discussing depth of field. Um, at a certain size, the blur circles are seen by points by our eyes because we can't resolve any smaller. Uh, the aperture controls the size of these blur circles. Bigger blur circles take the shape and a number of blades of the aperture and affect the look of the out of focus areas that some people call bokeh. So we saw this again before, but worth looking at again. The lens can only focus on that black line. Everything in front of behind that is slightly out of focus. When we stop down the lens, we get a larger area of what's appearing in focus. So here's what's happening. The gray box represents the range where the circle of confusion is small enough to be seen as a point in focus. Look at it another way. So we have the lens, the aperture, and the depth of field. As we close down the lens, the light rays get narrowed and the depth of field extends. So misconceptions, depth of field is one third in front and one two thirds behind the plane of focus. Uh, there is certain focus distance that that's gonna happen at, but it doesn't maintain throughout. As you focus and, and move the camera around, the, the depth of field moves forward and backwards. Shorter lenses tend to have more depth of field behind the subject, Longer lenses tend to have the depth of field distributed more evenly. Uh, depth of field is not the same as depth of focus. I mean, every once in a while I hear someone talking about depth of field and all of a sudden in the middle they change the term to depth of focus. Depth of field happens outside the camera. Depth of focus happens inside the camera. It's how far off the sensor or film can be from the actual and focal plane. Aberrations. I'm just going to mention them because there's not much that you can do about them. Uh, lens designers have to work out formulas to balance the and reduce the lens aberrations. There's usually nothing you can do about most of them, but some aberrations can be lessened by stopping down the lens. Uh, here's the list. Ignore it. <laughs> uh, but just let's look at number five and number six, distortion and chromatic aberration. Uh, distortion is one thing you can make some corrections for in post-processing. You have pin cushion or barrel distortion, and I'm sure you've seen that in your lenses, and you can fix that in Lightroom or Photoshop Camera Raw. And chromatic aberrations show up as color fringes along the edges of lines in the photo. Again, there's a correction area for that in Camera Raw and Lightroom. Now we're gonna to get to one of my favorite subjects, perspective. It's the relationship between the objects in the photograph. So a lot of people think the lens changes perspective as we move in and out, but it's not the lens that's doing it, it's the movement. 
So the area of a scene that is common to any two lenses at the same camera position will show the same perspective. Compression, it's not determined by focal length. Again, if the camera's in the same position with two photos, a shorter and a longer lens, the area that's common is gonna be the same. Let's see what we can show those here. Telephoto compression, misnomer, it doesn't exist. All, as I said, all lenses show the same perspective from the same camera position. Short lenses allow you to get closer to your subject and that getting closer is what makes the foreground objects bigger and the background smaller. Longer lenses force you to move back, the act of which makes the foreground and background objects appear more similar in size. Using a longer focal length lens from the same position is about the same as cropping the photo in post-production without the loss of resolution. So the closer you are to your subject, the smaller the background is, the further away you are, the bigger the background is gonna appear. So it might be better just call it distance compression. So here I have a photo, obviously taken with a wide angle lens, the perspective is deep as expected with the short lens. Then we have the photo compressed with perspective as you expect from a long lens. But in reality, there are two different crops from the same photograph. Okay, so that was a little bit of a trick. But if these were taken with two different lenses, the area of the scene with common to both would be the same. So let's look at that for two lenses. Here's a studio setup taken with a 15 millimeter lens at four feet from the subject. Same taken with the 77 millimeter lens, again at the same 48 inches from the subject. And again, the center of the scene that's common to both shows the same perspective. The perspective is not altered by the lens choice. One more, again, an obvious wide and compressed shots. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Again, two crops from the same photograph. So what lens should you choose? It's easy, use the one that fits. Think of lenses like a set of wrenches. Ansel Adams quote here, the one of my favorites of his, a good picture is knowing where to stand. So if you want a large subject that stands out from the background or that feels close and intimate with the background elements being far away, get close to your subject and then select a short lens to fit the subject into the frame as you want. So here I've got in close to make the head larger than the body in the background. Then I selected a short lens, I think it was about a 16 millimeter here, which will be a 10 millimeter on APS-C or an eight millimeter on a micro four thirds. Again, it's the distance, not the focal length that's determining the perspective. If you want a large subject that blends into the background, step back and then select a longer lens to frame the subject. This is where a zoom lens really comes in handy. Like I said, think of the different focal lengths as different size wrenches, and think of a zoom as an adjustable wrench. Here I moved back to flatten out the perspective, then selected a long lens, 400 millimeters in this case, to frame the subject. Then we get into portraits, where the effect or not a focal length on the drawing of the face. I'm sure you've all seen this sort of comparison. Uh, it supposedly shows you the defective focal length, but really what they're showing is the defective distances. Here, all these images are made with different focal length lenses, but from the same camera position. Notice that the look of the face is the same in all of them. If I then change it out and take all the photos with the same 24 millimeter lens, but at different camera to subject distances, then you see what's happening to the face changing. And that's because I changed distance with the same lens. Two samples from each group, the 24 millimeter and then the 48 inches. So my advice to you is don't blame the lens. The lens did two things. It tempted you to move in closer, it allowed you to move in closer, but ultimately it was you who did move in closer. The lens, as I said earlier, doesn't have a brain or legs. It doesn't know when it's in closer, when it's far away, and it can't get up and move in closer or move back for you. You're ultimately responsible. Take a look at these two. They're taken with the same lens, a 15 millimeter. The difference in face shape comes from the working distances. 
The first one's from 10 inches away. You can't see the ears. The nose is big compared to the eyes. And then as we get further away, the face flattens out. Again, same lens, different distances. So how do we use this to solve some problems? Comes down to often being at the wrong distance or needing to be at a different distance. How many times you've taken a group photo with the people on the edge get all stretched out and look horrible? The problem was you're too close to them. Got to move back. You can then use a longer lens of crop in. This is a full frame 24 millimeter, but I was so far away from everyone that the people on the edge are relatively normal looking. But let's take it to an extreme. Here I have a 15 millimeter lens. It's about 12 inches from the three subjects. All the subjects are actually facing directly forward, but they look stretched and turned in the photos. That's because the lens is seeing both the sides and the front of them at the same time. So this only happens to three dimensional subjects. Here I put a flat photo in place of one of the subjects on the side and you see that there's no distortion in the photograph. Another example of that. I have two tennis balls here, uh, photographed really close. The center one's round, but the one on the edge is stretched. But a photo of a tennis ball up in the upper corner is not affected because there's no sides to be seen by the lens. So back to this 12 inch lens uh, image. The next slide we'll see what happens when you look at the same lens used at 48 inches. What do you think will happen? So at 48 inches now, all the faces seem to be normal and looking forward. Didn't change anything, any positions of the, of the mannequins. I just moved the camera straight back. So we'll compare the 15 millimeter now with the 50 millimeter from the same position. So you see the 15 just shows more of the scene than the 50 does. What if I crop the M15 to match the framing of the 50? They're virtually the same. The focal length again is only controlling the magnification. The camera position remains the same, the perspective remains the same, no matter the focal length used. So what if your backdrop is too narrow? You can move back from the subject and now make the background wider. Let's go back to the same set of photos again. The 15 at 12 inches, and at 48 inches. Notice as we backed up, the background became relatively larger and now they all fit on the background. So you have to choose when to crop. You can crop in the camera with, by using a longer lens or you can crop in post-processing and lose resolution. Then we have the, the old standby of buildings appearing to be falling backwards. Remember that objects closer to the camera, such as the cathedral doors or the engines of the rocket, appear bigger than objects further away, the top of the spires or the tip of the rocket. This is actually normal perspective. Uh, it's what it, the way it looks like to us, but our brain compensates for it. Uh, I feel in a photo, though, the brain doesn't know what to do, and it makes you think that the things are falling backwards. Again, you're in too close if this is happening. The same thing happens with the road narrowing off into the distance, but our brain accepts that one. So remember, the buildings falling back is accurate. Whatever's close to the camera appears larger to the camera. To fix it, move back. So here, the Tory gates we are falling off in size as they go back, but our brain accepts that. And the temple on the side here was taken with an 18 millimeter lens, but from far enough away and with the camera back straighter on so it doesn't feel like it's falling back too much. So how are we doing out there? Everyone's so quiet. All good. Oh, good. All good. good. This is okay. good stuff. Good. So let's talk about some lens accessories. Uh, lens hoods, the cut down flare uh, from high intensity off axis lights. They provide protection from bumps and scratches and you'll never see me out without a lens hood on. Then we can go to filters, uh, glass or plastic devices used to alter the image. Uh, they can add color, they can soften the edges of details, uh, they can block UV light, which is not needed with dis digital because the coatings on the sensor block the UV light anyway. Uh, when black and white, they can control contrast and they can be used a number of special effects. They come in different sizes to fit different lenses 
and there are step up and step down rings so you can use the same filters on different sizes. So like for example, here's a special effect one called a multifacet filter. Let's see if I put one up here if that. Here's where it gets controversial. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't believe that filters are meant for protecting the front elements of a lens, except if you're in a like a salt water environment or other areas where things are flying at the lens. Uh, the filters are usually not high in quality of glass as the lens element, and they're much more fragile than the lens elements. Um, I know people will say, well, I had a, I dropped the lens and the front element and the lens filter I had on it cracked and saved the lens. So here's a filter with some cracked glass in it and you can see here the glass is very thin and easily breaks and I'd be more concerned about this breaking and falling in and shattering and scratching the lens than the drop because here's a front element of a camera lens and you can see it's much thicker and much more durable. I remember years ago being photographed by a newspaper guy here in Seattle and his 35 millimeter lens had a big chunk of glass chipped out of the front of it. And it said it made no difference to the images. Then there's filter wrenches. Sometimes your filters get stuck to each other or to a lens. So here's filter wrenches that go around each other here. And then you can squeeze them on and, and break the break bond between the, the filters that are stuck together. Um, Let's see, more misconceptions about lenses. Wide versus tele or short versus long. People say the wide angle lenses cause converging verticals. Uh, they stretch the edges of the frame or uh, the long lenses have a narrow depth of field or they have flat perspective while short lenses have a steep perspective. We've covered the first two with the building falling backwards and the group photos before. So let's go on to the other two things here. Uh, do long lenses give less depth of field? Let's find out. What do you think is going to happen here? Here we see the photo made with the 24 millimeter lens has a lot more depth of field than the one made with the 105. So there is truth to that statement. Even crop to show the same framing, the 24 millimeter wins. And that's my friend Noma Cello there who you see over my shoulder. Uh, so yes, you need more depth of, if you need more depth of field, use a shorter lens, but know that the subject's gonna be smaller in the frame. But wait, there's more. Let's go back to both lenses at the same distance. Nomicello is tiny in the 24 millimeter photo. So what happens if we move the camera in to make our friend larger, about the same size as he is in the 105 millimeter photo? Now the depth of field is virtually the same. The background's gotten much smaller when we got in closer. So let's crop them to about the same again. And you'll see that the same approximate crop gives the same approximate blur. So even cropped to similar framing, the depth of field remains the same at both focal lengths. Again, the focal length alone is not a contributor to depth of field. You need to combine it with the length and focal length and distance or magnification. So magnification and f-stop are your real controls. So the takeaway here is that wide angle lenses do have more depth of field, but all lenses have the same depth of field when the image size is constant. Let's go now into the long lenses here and we'll finish up pretty soon on this. Uh, do long lenses have a flatter perspective than short lenses? A friend of mine sent me these photos on Facebook. Uh, she was asking how come the space needle was so big at the window when she got off an elevator at work, but as she walked down the corridor, the space needle got smaller and smaller. She said her coworkers were starting to wonder about her. She paced the corridors muttering, whoa, whoa, to herself. So I went down to visit here and uh, to demonstrate that the perspective is determined by her distance from the window. These photos were all taken with a 24 millimeter lens with the different distances from the window. As you can see, the space needle is the same size in all three photos because it's relatively the same distance from her when she's at the elevator and when she's at the window. The 30 or 40 foot walk between the elevator and the window has no effect on the size of the Space Needle, which is around a half mile away. And in reality, the Space Needle isn't even the subject of the photo, the window really is. So I switched to a 105 millimeter and took the photo from the elevator showing the needle filling the window. Then I cropped the 24 millimeter taken from the same place 
and you see that the perspective is the same at 24 and 105. So our summary here is you make the decisions. Don't blame the lens. Different focal lengths are like different size wrenches. A zoom lens is like an adjustable wrench. So what are some of your takeaways from today? Anyone want to jump in? Hey, John. Yeah, Joe. I mean, I, uh, I've heard you talk about this before, and of course I've you know, read about it elsewhere. It all pretty much makes sense. I, I would just say that when I'm out in the field or in, in the studio and you know, working with limited time and mm -hmm. uh, lots of things to keep track of, <laughs> like keeping all this straight is a challenge. You know? Yeah, and, and, uh, and it's stuff to keep, just to know in the back of your mind. I mean, there's right. certain things, you shoot theater like I do, there right. you don't have a choice. There, yep. you're in a position, you only have one lens usually that's gonna work for you. You know, this is more where you're trying to be creative with control, or if you're out doing landscapes and the like, you know. Mm -hmm pick the subject to camera to subject distance that gives you the perspective you want, then pick the lens that fills the frame. And that's where the zoom lens helps. Mm, but yeah. yeah. And you know, like everyone says in 85 millimeter for portraits, that that's because the 85 millimeter puts you at about five feet from the subject for a bust shot. And that works really nice, but that's for right. a 35 millimeter camera. If you're in a micro four thirds, you only need 25 millimeter or 30 millimeter to be at that same position. So, you know, it's more important to understand distances. But again, it's things you'll just have in the back of your mind. I, I do like the sort of debunking of these sort of myths, like, you know, zoom with your feet, things like mm -hmm. that. That's always, it's also good just to kind of clear that out of the way. Yeah, I mean, I want you to get up and move around and try different angles and perspectives. But zooming doesn't do that. Zooming exactly. keeps the same perspective. It's being lazy. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? What I'm, yeah, I, Jim. I, I've heard you talk about this before as well, and it, every time it's a good reminder to pay attention to the geometry of what you're doing, that the yeah, intersection yeah. Of, of angle of view with the relationship of your, of your subject to the background um, is right. what you need to pay attention to. Yeah, you, well, you're a filmmaker. I mean, the yeah. cinema, cinema photographers understand this just inherently. I mean, they, there's so much writing on the line for them that they really understand this stuff. Uh, there's a book called The Visual Story, I believe, by Bruce Block that I highly recommend for still photographers, mm -hmm. even though it's a, made for, um, for cinematographers. It really goes into all this stuff really well and explains it well. Well, it's like when, for filmmaking, when a subject starts to move you mm -hmm. need to be ready for that movement you need to anticipate it with lenses and angles and lighting mm -hmm. and yeah you've got so much that costs that that shot costs <laughs> so much money if you can't get the shot you you are not asked back <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool well hopefully people got something out of this and it wasn't too pedantic or too too boring uh, i'm just trying to think if there's anything else to, well, to cover in there I've always gone by the saying that uh, a photographer always thinks that the best lens for the job is the one they don't own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that leads to guess, gear acquisition syndrome. Yeah. But I mean, there's the holy trinity of lenses, the 16 to 35, the 24 to 70, and the 70 to 200. Um, once you have those, you're pretty well covered. And then you add in a 2X converter for the 70 to 200, and you, you're up to 400 millimeter. And... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, John, Joe again. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I had a question early on in your presentation, but I didn't want to stop you at that point. Yeah. One of your very first shots was with the four millimeter lens on the um, the iPhone uh -huh. compared to, I can't remember exactly what it was. And 24 course, millimeter. Two, yeah. And I was, I was wondering, like, what was there other things that, okay, so uh, I'm trying to remember. What else did you do to make those images look the same? Or did they just really just come out? I mean, they're just crossed. Else? Crop to the same. Um, okay. That's that's pretty much it. Let's see if I can go those with four millimeter, twenty four, and twenty four. So the camera position is the same. You like go. you know, it's the same. I put a tripod on it. Put the iPhone on the tripod. Then I switched and put the full frame camera on the tripod. And that's pretty mm -hmm. much it. Uh, the only thing is I changed the aspect ratio for the thirty five millimeter camera from two by three to four by three to match the okay. iPhone yeah. cropping, yeah. but. 
but that's really about it. Maybe different exposure just because of the lenses or something? Well, um, yeah, because the, the iPhone, I don't really have much control over the exposure. That's, that's a great comparison. I really appreciate that. Sure. Coming up this week, I got Matthew Jordan Smith on Thursday in the evening and a different time and a different URL. So make a note of that if you want to join in that conversation. And then Bambi Cantrell next week. And even further next week's another friend of mine, Johnny Edwards, a creative director and visual storyteller is going to be joining us. A uh, little plug for myself. These are all free. If you want to send me something via PayPal as a gratuity, you can, but that's not expected. Uh, but I also am doing one-on-one -on -one training of lighting and things like that. So let's show you. That. And I think that's about it for today. So let me stop the share. It's open time now. Um, you know, I think today is the anniversary of the uh, Freedom Train, uh, mm. the funeral train for Robert uh, Robert Kennedy. And there's uh, two really good books out there, beautiful, amazing photo books about that time, one by Robert Fusco, F-U-S-C-O, mm -hmm. and the other by um, Bill Epridge. Uh, so if just anyone happens to be thinking about that, I just crossed my mind this morning. Yeah, I remember going out to see that train go by in Elizabeth, New Jersey at the time. Uh, it was uh, it was an amazing time, an amazing an amazing event in the photographs. Or you could just probably just Google it, and probably find yeah. photographs. See if I can do this. Here's the Robert Fuse. <laughs> uh huh. Here's Bill Epridge's book. And Bill Epridge, I think, just passed away last year or the year before. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording here. Thank you all for joining us. It's been fun. Uh, see you next week. And let's be well. Wash your hands, all that stuff.